Uh, joining us now is Scott Gerlach. He is the co-founder of Stackhawk. And Scott's going to talk to us today about some of the challenges that developers have when it comes to application security. Uh, reminder, throw your questions into the Q&A panel, and we will cover those with Scott at the end of his talk. With that, Scott, I am going to turn it over to you. Awesome. Thanks, Alyssa. Hi, everybody. What's up? All the talks, everyone that's participating. Uh, I'm Scott Gerlach. We're talking about three reasons developers struggle with AppSec and how to make it easier today. Uh, like I said, I'm Scott Gerlach. This is my quarantine hair. I hope everyone enjoys that because it makes me feel great. Uh, I'm the CSO, as Alyssa mentioned, CSO, co-founder of Stackhawk. Uh, I was the CISO at SendGrid for three years, a senior security architect at GoDaddy for a long, long time, nine years. Um, husband, brewer, dad, golfer, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you can see my Twitter and LinkedIn handles there if you need to get a hold of me at some point. <clears throat> Brief warning before we get started. Some of the things I'm going to say in this uh, in this talk may, be, uh, may, may attack you on a personal level, but that's not what they're intended to do. We're trying to point out some of the some of the things and the flaws and thinking that are preventing us from being successful in our AppSec programs. Uh, real quickly, AppSec problem overview. AppSec is good in theory. Uh, just covering some of the tools that are out there right now, some of the categories of tools, static code analysis, uh, looking at source code, dependency libraries, et cetera. These are sometimes noisy and often lack application context. How is this code being used? What is it actually doing? Is it only being used in dev, et cetera? Uh, and then language dependent. So um, obviously, if you've got some languages that are not supported, Go being one of my favorites, uh, SendGrid was a big Go uh, shop, and there's not a lot of great tools for Go out there right now. Uh, dynamic code analysis or DAST, uh, these are better at actual app and context, but they're still somewhat noisy, right? And they're tough to configure sort of tough to configure to be able to scan a, an application in context. And they're hard to use. They're built for security people. Uh, and then RASP, IAST, WAF, this is all kind of the wait till someone finds it in prod type of scenario. And these are great as a, a backstopping tool. So as you do your AppSec lifecycle and you've made your way through uh, design and development, and then you've, you've got what you think is a pretty solid thing out in production. These are the thing that can help back you up from actual attacks. Uh, AppSec is super hard to scale. Uh, all of these solutions need people, specifically security people, to be super effective. Um, maybe SAST doesn't necessarily, and there's some good tools that are trying to change that. Um, but there's no real try and buy. Everything's hidden behind the contact us for a demo, sales, cycle. It's really tough to kind of figure out really quickly are these things good for our company and our AppSec program? Uh, and they're really, really expensive. So all these tools are, most of these tools are six figure, five, high five, six figure contract type tools that you're locked into a one year at least type of a contract. Uh, and so I took a picture of the actual amount of money I've spent trying to build AppSec programs over the years. Um, this is for real money. No, it's not for real money. Anyway, really, really hard to to buy, and you get you get all these great tools, and you try them out, and you're going, man, this can really make my AppSec program really, really strong and good. And I'm going to bring it in house. I've run some demos on some of our apps, getting good results. I want the developer community to run these tools, and then we start doing security things to it, and we start going, okay, no one can be admin except for me. Uh, I'm our security department is going to be the champion of uh, we are the only ones that can approve things and let things go through the development cycle or blocking builds or deciding what is actually risky. Um, and then what we end up with doing is, is taking that awesome security tool and it dies in the vine because we, we kill it. We just, we, we Tommy boy it up a little bit. Uh, and then we wonder three, four, five months in, man, why is this tool not being successful when I demoed it and we tried it? We were getting good results out of it. We had a couple developers try it out and they were like, yes, it's okay. 
uh, and and we we wonder how come that's happening, and and we're going to get into some of that stuff. But I think part of that is because of uh, our trust issues. We have issues trusting the people that we've hired throughout the company to be able to do their jobs and do their jobs effectively. I was at uh, B sides RSA earlier this year, and this is a tweet that Charlie sent out. And, and if Charlie's watching or people know Charlie, I hope no one gets angry at me for this, but he said, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if a new hire dev is in a position to evaluate risk for a feature product or company. I think professional security people can do this better. And it strikes me that this has, um, so much non how developers work cooked into it. A new hire developer also isn't in the position probably to in a silo push code to production or understand how the code that he's working on, he or she is working on affects the other code bases that you're interacting with. So this, this tweet kind of says, you know, I'm going to bring on a new hire dev and they're instantly going to be, uh, making huge decisions within the organization. And I, I think that's, I'm not sure that's his intent, but that's what I read that as. And and I like to think of this as more of a, I wouldn't want to put a new hired developer in the position of making an uninformed risk decision. I don't so much mind that a developer makes a risk decision as long as they document it for me somewhere or they write something down or make a note in a repo or something so that I can have a conversation about, you know, why was that decision made? Uh, so I think that's a better way to kind of tackle that and, and get through that trust, trust and support thing. But really this is one of the keys to how we silo the security and engineering departments is we kind of build that animosity in between those uh, departments by not saying, Hey, we trust, you know, the company hired you engineering leadership hired you and they trust you, but I don't because I'm a security guy and I don't trust anybody, but we're all in the same place trying to make the same thing happen for the company. Ultimately we care differently as security people and developers. Uh, devs tend to care about in this specific order, performance, quality, ease of use, efficiency, and security. And next to those things, I've put some of the tools that, that help them instrument those things. Uh, so performance, we've got the time tool and some load tests. Under quality, we've got unit tests and integration tests. Ease of use, you've got linters so people can look at code and they understand how that works and user, user experience. Efficiency, we can look at how the application is using memory heap. And then that last one, security, I guess they use Google to understand Stack Overflow, to understand security. Um, and really they care about those things in specific order that they can easily know and make decisions on. So the easier it is for them to go, yep, I understand this, I can move on to the next thing. Yep, I understand this, I can move on to the next thing. The more they'll make those decisions. And then InfoSec teams, we tend to care about in this order, security, 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 and then maybe some feelings down at the bottom occasionally. Uh, people are taking all of those bits and bytes and code that they write and they feel really passionate about them. It's art to them, right? It's artwork. And when we get to do our job, we don't take the, we don't take that fact into account while we're talking to people about these things. Uh, real quickly, I want to talk about the evolution of linting. Uh, way back in days of old, we had code standards documentation, and uh, corporate and they would read something like, corporate hath deemed thou shalt use spaces, not tabs. Thine indentation shalt be three and a half spaces, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the, it was the developer's job to read that code standards documentation and implement it in their code, which is ridiculous. Like, how are you going to remember a 30-page documentation book and then write code? So developers do what developers do. And they said, look, this is a job for computers. Computers can do this super effectively. We can write our linting rules. Uh, someone's done the heavy linting and documenting for us. And then we add little tiny rules on top of that to make code more readable, more reliable across the organization. And we can check it while we're writing code so it shows up in our IDE. We can run a lint uh, on our local code base before we commit it. And then CI Pipeline can back that up for us. So as other people are committing code, they're held to the same, same coding standards that 
we've instrumented, which is awesome. That's how devs want to work. So problem number one, uh, problem number one is about knowing AppSec or at least being able to make decisions. Probably in one of these talks somewhere, uh, and I know Matthias was talking about it earlier, we go, let's teach developers how to write secure code. Uh, and we, if we, we think that if they know how attackers think, they'll be able to test like an attacker, and then we say hack yourself and, and all these good things. But we put all these roadblocks in the way to make this really, really effective. There's a ton of new acronyms that you have to learn to be able to understand uh, how to do application security. In fact, there's two for one thing, CSRF, XSRF. That's even confusing for me, and I work in the industry. Um, but then before we do that, let's talk about risk. So we should know how to calculate risk, and we should know that uh, likelihood and impact equals risk. And you guys should know that because developers also should know, understand that for. But wait, also, did you know the internet is bad? Bad things happen on the internet. Um, and then so we get into this loop of like, hey, we want to teach you stuff that's not your job. We want to teach you to be us as AppSec pros. Um, and no one, and everyone's like, okay, I guess a little extra knowledge can't hurt. And then if you've ever done an AppSec training program, uh, I've done a couple of them, and here's how it usually goes. Hey, engineering leadership, I need five of your best people, uh, best engineers to send to a security training program. I want to teach them how to think like attackers, think them, teach them how to see vulnerable code in a in, uh, code base and be able to fix those things. And so then the engineering leadership goes, yeah, absolutely. Here's my five best people who are likely not going to make these mistakes in the first place. Uh, they're way too busy shipping features because we rely, rely on them heavily to be the leaders of the engineering organization to go out and train other developers in the AppSec ways. Uh, and in fact, I've asked the uh, some of my engineers that I've sent to training, hey, when you come back from this program, if you see something in a code base that you're working on that you learned from and fix from this AppSec program that you went to, can you tag that for me in a, in a PR or something so I can track that and put together, you know, we learned something out of this AppSec program and we've implemented it in code. And I don't think I've ever seen someone tag something in the code base uh, for an organization that they learned from an AppSec program. And so the next thing we do is, is we go, hey, uh, when we want to teach you how to be us, it's really important that you really learn how to be us, how to be AppSec professionals, which is weird to me because you never see the accountants do this to an executive when the execs, exec team goes, hey, we need to model a price increase or change the cost structure for one of these products that we have. Dear accounting, can you help us understand that? The accountants don't go, sweet, uh, we'd be happy to help you with that, but let's teach you about the GL first. So the GL is debits and credits. And what you're going to do on this, that's not what they do, right? It's they provide tooling and information for those exec teams to be able to make decisions quickly based on cooked in models, huge giant spreadsheets or whatever modeling tool that they're using so that exec teams can plug in top line numbers, bottom line numbers, see what that flows through to be. They don't have to understand to the nth degree how accounting works, how the GL is set up in that organization, all the details of what the accountants are doing, they can just quickly decide, plug in information, make decisions. And we should do more of that as security teams. We should provide the organization, specifically when we're talking about AppSec, the engineering team with tools and information so they can make decisions. So they can decide quickly and get on the get on the path of getting that product out into productions because it benefits the company in some form or fashion. Now there are good AppSec tools out there, AppSec dev tools, uh, kind of developer native tools that work the way that developers work in the context of how they work. Obviously Sneak, sponsor of all the talks. Uh, FOSA, NPM Audit is a good one. 
uh, GitHub and their new package inspection PR bot stuff. And there's at least one more coming that has a logo that looks similar to this um, named Stackhawk. Anyway, those, those tools are, are gaining a lot of ground with developer communities because they enable them to make decisions quickly. They enable them in the context of what they're doing to be able to go, I understand that there's some risk or no risk or a lot of risk in the code base that I've got because these tools have informed me of my library vulnerabilities, the, the package dependency tree that I have, or um, the NPM audit is, is a good one. NPM audit fix is always a fun one to watch happen. Uh, things tend to break there, but you know, it's, it's, those are good tools that are empowering developers to be able to say, yes, I can make decisions here in, in the, in my own timeline. Job roles. We're just sort of misaligned uh, as engineers and security teams. When security teams approach their job, excuse me, <coughs> they kind of come at it like, hey, my job specifically kind of AppSec and infrastructure security teams, my job is to break things and, and understand why they broke and, and really get to the meat of how can someone leverage the threat surface in my company to escalate. And we look at it like this. Everything is broken. I've broken all the things. I'm so happy about the super hard attacks that I made um, and the super hard chaining of requests that I had to do and the interesting pivot I made inside the company from a, from a vulnerability standpoint. And that's great. We really should be proud of those things because they're hard, right? They're hard as, as an AppSec pro to be able to go, uh, if I take this token from here and I pipe it through this other application and I can get myself into this third thing, I can actually leverage some kind of um, escalation. But we approach the end part of that the wrong way. We come, we come back to engineering and go, hey, I broke the crap out of your thing. Isn't that awesome? And no one thinks that's awesome. No one thinks that the hard work that they put in uh, needs to be demonized in the way that we we tend to do it because we're so proud of the thing that we did um and and building that's another one of those bridge building functions where we can partner with engineering teams to say hey let's get together and talk about how this attack worked or how this thing worked that i found with engineering and product because product is the one that's out there helping us uh, prioritize this work um, and so being able to, being able to partner with engineering teams on stuff that we found is super important. And then we talk about the AppSec expense and, and why it's really expensive to not only find and, but fix stuff way out of this develop and deploy cycle. So often we get into, let's test an application after the deploy cycle, the deploy piece of the cycle has happened. So we've put something out into prod. It's been one to six months or something like that. And we're like, hey, we should test this thing. Um, when did you deploy that? Okay, so it's been out in the wild for three months, four months, five months, six months, two years, whatever. Uh, and so we find our cool things, we break stuff and we're like, sweet. Hey, engineering, here's a bunch of tickets. Um, and so we try to jam that right back into the develop cycle. And once again, not talk to the product managers to tell them why it's important, really talk about why that's a risk, why it should be fixed or why it could wait. Um, and so, to, and we hope that engineers are just like, okay, I believe you and we'll go ahead and fix all this stuff and not ship features. The other thing that's important there is we don't, we, we sometimes, don't take the context of the risk into account. And we, we think, you know, if this internal directory that we've built has a vulnerability in it, then we should really focus on that. And maybe you should, if that's the only thing left in the entire organization. And only then that's a maybe. If your internal directory, which by the way, there's an external directory called LinkedIn, has some vulnerabilities in it, and you've got the crown jewels, you should definitely not be focused on the internal directory. You should be focused on 
taking care of the main asset of the company, the thing that makes the company work, the thing that makes the company revenue, you should be working on that definitely for sure. Um, and so often we, we struggle saying, should I even have been testing this in the first place? Is this the right place to be spending my energy as an AppSec professional or as a security team? And then we do the, and then we do the anti over game with engineering and we, we file, we take that big, long AppSec report that we get and we file tickets for all the things we say, Hey guys, found a lot of cool stuff here. Hit me up if you got any questions. And then we hope that the engineers are like, yes, I totally want to know all about this stuff. Let me talk to those security people. Again, no prioritization, no importance of why this thing is risky, what the impact to the assets that it controls, um, those kinds of things that are happening in the organization. Again, building silos between those teams. Lastly, just say yes. Uh, we like to, we like to, our security teams get branded as the department of no, and that's because of how we approach partnership. That's because of how we approach answering questions that engineers and accounting and IT and, and all those teams have about problem solving. Uh, I swear to you, I built this deck before all the talks was a thing. Uh, I hate this guy in this context. I hate the fix all the things guy. All the talks guy, he's good. I like him. Fix all the things guy, I hate him. Being For us to say everything that we find should be fixed is just disingenuous. We're not in the business of, of um, fixing, patching. We're in the business of providing a service to a customer, and we should be prioritizing heavily the things that are really, really important and understanding being able to understand in the context of the organization, what are those things that are really, really important? So instead of the fix all the things guy, which again, I think he's, I think he's the wrong thing for what we should do with things we find as security teams. We should do the fix the right things. Be able to say, hey, this is something that we should fix because it's maybe it's low likelihood, but it has impact on one of the most critical assets in the organization or the thing that we're going to use to, to uh, provide service to a customer and provide value. Um, it might not even be a critical or a high or any of those things. Often, so often we get into this thing says critical, so we have to fix it. Well, it says critical. Sure. But is it in the right, it does it affect the right things that we need to be talking about and should we be addressing some of the lows on the critical assets, critical components of the system, talking about those things. And what that leads to is the chase to, perf to perfection. We, we find a ton of issues and then we say, we have to fix all of these things and we, and we chase the 100%. But why, what's the actual risk to the business? Um, and I liken this to, uh, actually my product manager has likened this to, what if your QA filed a thousand tickets for bugs that are unlikely to de degrade user experience. Like they're technically doing their job, right? They're finding bugs, but are they really providing value for the business and for the customer? And probably not. Probably uh, they're, they're saying, look at all the work that I've generated. That's my value. As opposed to look at how good we provided customer experience um, Look at how good we provided this product customer experience to the customers so they they love what we're doing. And this is a little different because attackers think a, different, a little bit differently, but I think this still holds a lot of water in how to think about what we're finding and what we're surfacing to the organization. And my favorite quote here uh, is from the product to VP that I talked to. Um, I never had a satisfying conversation on why a security issue is ever more important than a feature, ever. Mostly that's because they didn't work with me at the time. I'm bad at this too. But we forget that the product team needs to know this stuff too. We're just like, hey, engineers, fix things. Uh, be a good improv partner. So I love improv. I love improv comedy. And one of the things they teach you in improv is when someone says something, your next line should be yes and. And that is something that we struggle with as security teams a ton. An engineering team comes to us and goes, hey, we want to deploy 
some super new hotness in Kubernetes or AWS or Google GCP or something. And we're like, nah, that's not a good idea. Instead of, nah, that's not a good idea. Let's try, yes. And I would love to partner with you to understand that technology so we can do it safely. Hey, we wanna, we wanna uh, run all kinds of Linux laptops in the organization. Yeah, sure, cool. Let's work together so we can make that work and make it successful. The business is there to take risks. Uh, aside from security risk, the business is taking tons of risks all over the place. And we need to get into the habit of going, we should be taking risks. What are the right risks to take? And how can everyone know that those are the right risks to take? So again, being able to provide that information back to everyone. Closing, closing thoughts here uh, and getting to Q&A. Democratize security through the organization uh, with easy to use tools and information. So being able to consume that quickly and easily to be able to know that you're making sane decisions, what things you should be doing, what things you should do alternate ways if they're not the safest way. I don't particularly like when people say security is everyone's responsibility. Uh, it feels like security teams struggle with, we can't get everything done, so everyone has to help us. And that's just not how it really works. Um, accounting is not everyone's job. Pieces of accounting are everyone's job. Turn in your expense reports. But accounting is the responsibility of the accounting department. Uh, Janitor, everyone is not responsible for cleaning the restrooms at a company. Janitors are responsible. We are responsible for picking up our little pieces of trash. So saying security is everyone's responsibility is probably just way too broad generally. Um, and we don't do a good job of informing what that means. Uh, security equals quality. Engineers really care about the code that they write. They really do. Uh, and it's it's becoming more and more obvious that they care about performance and quality and, and reliability and being able to give them tools so that they can know security and make decisions on it is super important. Uh, just say no to your inner. If anything is wrong at all, it's all wrong. Uh, that that inner security guy that or inner security thing that happens where you're like, uh, we've got almost all of this stuff taken care of, but there's this one thing and it's going to sink the whole company. Just say no to that inner voice. Uh, and then support your dev teams. Go buy them some tacos. Go sit in their stand-ups. Go sit in their scrums when they're talking about things. Just listen, 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 listen. Understand what their, what their features they're trying to roll out, what bugs they're trying to fix, what problems they're trying to solve. Listen, 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 and then come back and say, hey, I'd like to help you with this thing that I've heard you guys heard you talk about over and over and over again, because I think it's related to security. Buy him some tacos. One of my favorite, uh, one of my favorite people that I talked to, he used to, he used to hand out tacos for good deeds, and it was really great. Um, lastly, some useful links for everybody out there. Uh, that first one is a shameless plug and not even shameless. Uh, we think the dynamic code analysis tool that a dev can use is super important. Uh, there's a secure code example here for anybody who's looking for an example of what super secure code looks like. And then obviously some links to those library analysis tools, uh, NPM audit, sneak, FOSA, et cetera. That's all the time I have for today. Uh, I'll be hanging out in Slack and there's my Twitter handle if you wanna talk to me later. Uh, I know there's some people in Slack chatting already. And it lists us back to outro me. <laughs> yep. Um, so excellent. Thank you for sharing. Uh, the only question we had, I'll let you address it in Slack later because uh, we're up against time here. But uh, someone wants to know why tacos. Um, I mean, because tacos, it seems like a pretty easy answer. Um, yes, the talks are recorded. Uh, those who registered will get an email following the conference with links to all of the talks from all the talks. So thanks, Scott. I appreciate it. Folks, we'll take just a very, very, very short break here and we'll be right back.